bear with me. All right, we're good. Okay, great. I'm in a call to order the Clean Energy Alliance Board of Directors meeting. It is January 21st, 2021 at 2 p.m. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Member Drucker? Here. Member Bob Patel? Here. Chair Becker? Present. Thank you. Thank you. We would now like to have the flag salute and I'll give you a few minutes to get the flag up on the screen. Okay, and we have board member Drucker going to lead us in the flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, under God, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. All right, do we have any board members' comments or announcements today? If I, can get this here. I do not see any hands up. Is that the CEA dog or? There we go, great. Okay, we um, need to declare a CEA board vice chair position vacant and then elect the vice chair. So um, Madam CEO, do you have any comments on this? Um, I do not, we have a vacancy as a result of uh, Chair Becker being uh, not elected to the chair position. And so it would be appropriate for the board to nominate a vice chair. Okay, great. Um, at the last meeting, I had nominated um, Carlsbad um, to take the vice chair position. And I'm still willing to do that unless somebody else has any other grand ideas. So that would mean uh, board member Bot Patel would be the vice chair. I'm willing to hear any comments. No, that's fine with me. Okay, is that is that good with you, board member Bot Patel? Sure, happy to serve. <laughs> okay, great. So I'll make a motion that the vice chair will be um, Bot Patel. Um, do I have a second? Second. All right, uh, we'll call for the vote. Member Drucker? Yes. Member Bob Patel? Aye. Chair Becker? Yes. Motion carries. Congratulations and also welcome. We're so happy to have you. All right, presentation. So today we have a special presentation from the San Diego Community Power. So I'll turn that over to the appropriate person. Um, Chair Becker, if we could maybe uh, jump to uh, the next one where... Okay. Um, let's do that. Let's, let's hear about our fiscal year 2019-2020 annual financial report presentation. And I would like to introduce our auditors from the uh, firm of Lance Stahl and Longhard. They did prepare. Uh, hi, uh, this is the, Diane Nygaard with North County here. They did complete the, uh, our inaugural, our first uh, partial fiscal years audit. And they are here to provide information and presentation to the board with regards to the, that audit. So I'm but, trying to- um, We are trying to, uh, maybe I'm trying to what you have. If you're not speaking, if you don't mind, I'm muting. Um, so Ryan, uh, if you'd li like, are you able to share your screen or would you like me to for the presentation? No, I have the presentation and I can uh, share my screen if that works for you. Great. One moment. One moment. Hopefully everybody can see that okay. Yes. Perfect. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me to present uh, the results of CEA's first ever annual audit. So I'm very uh, pleased to be here and 
share what we did and uh, the results of it. Um, so we were engaged uh, by CEA to perform the financial audit and to assist in the preparation of the annual audited financial statements. Um, like we previously mentioned, these are the first ones ever. So it was a lot of fun getting to start from scratch and really put together a, a brand new financial statement. You don't get to do that too often. So that was a little bit different. Um, other audit uh, responsible, uh, responsibilities that we had was to design uh, the audit to obtain reasonable assurance on fair presentation of the financial statements in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. Uh, we also obtained an understanding of the internal controls over financial reporting to help us plan appropriate audit procedures that would uh, be able to provide the reasonable assurance. So the audit process and uh, reports that were issued uh, kind of is outlined here. Uh, for field work, it was a little bit different this year due to COVID-19 and having to do everything remotely, uh, but in a, uh, Normally we would have a two-phase audit with interim and year-end field work, but just due to the size and uh, nature of the entity and the timing in which we were uh, engaged to perform the audit, we did everything pretty much all in one sitting. Um, so during that time, we, we planned appropriate procedures, we tested the internal controls, uh, we performed a, a risk assessment, uh, we did account analyses and substantive testing of transactions and accounts. We did a lot of that this year and I'll explain a um, little bit more in a second. Um, the end product that is included in your agenda packet is the annual financial report. Um, this report has two sections in it. One is the introductory section and then the other is the financial section. Introductory section has the transmittal letter which gives background information uh, on the entity and is kind of um, management's discussion of of the of the entity and what activities it's engaged in and then the the financial section is the the part that we are engaged to audit um, some other reports that we issued along with our auditor's opinion on the annual financial report would be our communication letter which is a written summary of the presentation i'm giving to you now and then our report on internal control and compliance so some highlights of the audit was, uh, like previously mentioned, due to COVID-19, we did perform uh, this audit 100% remotely. Uh, we wanna maintain the social distancing and make sure everybody is you know, staying healthy, my staff, and then obviously um, CEA staff as well. Um, but because of that, there is, was some special considerations we had to take um, because all of the supporting documents were provided electronically. We would have to really evaluate those documents a lot closer. We did additional procedures just to make sure that everything that was provided to us was good. And we did not have any, any issues with that. The audit went actually quite well. Um, and then additionally, because it is a first year audit, um, there's no prior comparative data to look back on. Uh, there's no trends uh, that we could look back on and help develop expectations. So we had to perform additional procedures uh, this year to basically test all those balances and lay the groundwork. So our um, materiality threshold was um, significantly smaller than in a lot of other audits. And we tested, um, I would say, 80% of all the transactions that happened during the year. So we really got a lot more um, assurance just on those beginning balances. Uh, the audit work is all performed to render an opinion on the basic financial statements. So that is the statements themselves and the footnotes. Uh, like previously mentioned, the introductory section is unaudited. We look it over very briefly just to make sure all the numbers match what's in the financial reports, but we don't, we don't audit the information in it. It's really just there for additional transparency. Um, ultimately, management is responsible for the form and content of the annual financial report, and we issued an unmodified opinion on the basic financial statements. So that is the best and highest opinion that the profession allows us to render. It means that these statements can be relied upon to make financial uh, decisions. Um, and then one other thing from our report that I just want to highlight is because this is the first ever annual audit, and there wasn't any comparative data um, for the prior years being available, uh, management did opt not to present a management's discussion analysis or statistical section. 
uh, because neither of them would provide any uh, useful data or anything new that wasn't in the transmittal or the basic financial statements. And even though this data is not presented, uh, it had no impact on our audit opinion. It's still uh, the best opinion we can offer. Uh, we also issued the report on internal control and compliance. Uh, this letter has the purpose of discussing deficiencies in internal control, or if we were to come across material instances of non-compliance with laws, regulations, um, if there were any grants, grant agreements, that type of thing. Uh, please report that we didn't identify any deficiencies in internal control that we consider to be material weaknesses or significant deficiencies. So it's a Short letter, it's very clean. Uh, it's uh, exactly what you want. We also had no um, instances of non-compliance with any uh, laws, regulations, those type of items. And then, uh, like I also previously mentioned, we also issued the auditor communication letter. Um, it's a written summary of what I'm talking about in this presentation. Uh, that, all, that letter also doesn't have a whole lot of anything of significance in it. It would discuss accounting policies, uses of estimates, significant disclosures, but there really wasn't anything there to report. Uh, we had no difficulties uh, performing the audit. Uh, we had no corrected or um, uncorrected misstatements. I should rephrase that. Uh, there was one minor adjustment that we had. It was completely immaterial, but it was corrected by management. So it's not sitting in the statements that, that you have. And then uh, we had no disagreements with management uh, over the application of accounting standards or principles or anything like that. So thank you for bearing with me for this uh, you know, five, 10 minutes. But in summary, we were engaged to perform a financial audit. We issued an unmodified opinion and we had no, no findings. So it was a good clean audit. Um, if you have any questions on the audit itself or what we did, I'm more than happy to um, field those and hopefully answer them. Great, thank you. Thank you for that financial report and um, that was good news. Do any board members have any questions? Seeing, oh, we do have one, board member Drucker. It's not really a question, it's just a comment that, uh, well done, really appreciate the report and, and the findings of, uh, of uh, no material weaknesses. Well, you're welcome, although that, that's all management's doing. They're the ones who did it right. So we just reported what they did. Good to know, thank you. Okay, should we go back to presentation number one or skip to uh, the third presentation? Um, thank you, uh, Chair Becker. We can go back to number one now that we figured out our technical difficulties and got the proper links to the folks. We have, I'd like to introduce, we have Bill Carnahan. He's an interim chief executive officer of San Diego Community Power, and they are, are the second additional CCA in San Diego Gas Electric Territory that we'll be launching this year. So our partners in this effort as we go down the same path, and Cody Hooven, who is their chief operating officer. So I will turn it over to them. And uh, Bill and Cody, would you like me to share your presentation, or I think you should you can as well? Okay. That's fine. I'll tell you, it's it's not very long. Uh, just hitting the high points, and then we, if we have time, we can we can answer some questions for you. But uh, uh, nice to see you, Barbara. Barbara and I have been bumping into each other in the CPA world for the last few years, and nice to see her uh, as well. So, uh, thank you all for inviting us. Uh, we've been invited, I think, to just give you an update on where we are, uh, and there are a lot of things happening where we are. Uh, as we're getting ready to go live uh, the 1st of March. So there's a lot of balls in the air. Uh, I've been on board since about November 1st. Uh, uh, and you'll see we're starting to staff up with other staffers later on. I'll show you that. But it's a pretty hectic time. Uh, we're on track. We've, it's not without its obstacles, as you all well know, but uh, we're making progress. I just kind of like to hit the highlights for you and then uh, we'll go from there. So uh, can I... Probably can I confirm, are you seeing the uh, screen with the San Diego Community Power uh, slide? Yes. And let me just make sure it's advancing. Did it just move? No. No. Okay, I've. this has been a, a glitch that I've had. Is it easier for me to do it, Barbara, if you did it 
I don't know if I have it here though. Okay, now are you seeing a slide that says update? Yes. And is it moving? Yes. Okay. Take it away, Bill. Okay. I'll just give me a signal. Okay, Let, let's go over to the first slide of substance. Uh, this is just what I told you we we're going to talk about. And I'm, I won't go through all of these because I'm sure you all have very similar uh, agreement, uh, agreements and goals, but I just would point out that uh, one of the key ones for us is that our goal is to be 100% renewable by 2035 or sooner. And of course, we'll be trying to make that happen, but that's uh, still a fairly aggressive goal. And we want to offer competitive rates as we go because realizing customers do have a choice. And if you aren't competitive and you aren't providing what they, they expect of you, they can, they can opt out. And you can read the rest of those. They're pretty, pretty standard, uh, I'm sure, in your own uh, entity. Uh, financing, uh, just to recap, some of you may already know this. There was a pre-formation loan by the city of San Diego of about half a million dollars. Uh, then there was uh, uh, private equity financing. And I'll have to say, Cody, who many of you know and is, was here during these phases of, of the operation, I was not, uh, was able to secure... Uh, private collateral for about 5 million. And then we're, once we get uh, up and operating, uh, we would be tapping the, uh, the uh, River City Bank uh, financing of 30 million. So we're about to do that. We're, we're, we're at the tail end of the five and the beginning of the 30. That should happen in the next uh, 30 to 60 days. Next. Uh, we're phasing, I understand you all may not be, but we're phasing uh, the entry of service uh, starting in uh, March, uh, you know, month, month and a half or so from now, a very small group of customers, mainly municipal and what we're calling quasi-municipal, uh, schools, uh, military, that sort of thing. Uh, partly because we don't want to impact too, too much on the uh, sdg and &E system. They're in the process of upgrading their, their billing system. And the, I think the, the more mature that system can become, the better off we are. That's not uncommon uh, for, for some CCAs to do that. You can see it's only about 3% of the load. Uh, in June, we would do fate, what we call phase two, which is the commercial industrial. Uh, you can see it's not a lot of customers. Uh, it's about 10% of the customers, but it's about 60% of the load. So it's a, it'll be a big hit uh, for us uh, in terms of resource uh, acquisition and sale and revenue, of course. And the last phase uh, is, is started there. We're currently looking at about a year from now, but quite frankly, that may slide that we're going to go back to the board and discuss that uh, at the next uh, board meeting uh, in a couple of weeks. But you can see there's about 695,000 estimated customers. So it's by far the, the, the most customers, but it's uh, only 38% of, of the load. So uh, you, you can see that the role that commercial, industrial, and residential play in terms of you know, demands on, on customer demands uh, and then uh, demand on energy and uh, service from, from the power suppliers. So the next one. Uh, we are in the midst. Uh, when I got here, we were just starting to really look at our or organization chart. And we, we actually, uh, we took a look after I got here. We looked at about 18 months, uh, 18 to 24 months. And this is what our org chart will look at, look like uh, at least the blue boxes at the end of 18 months. Uh, and, and, and the gold boxes are actually how we've su supplemented that with consultants, actually starting with consultants, then we'll be bringing on staff uh, and, and in many cases, either cutting back a, 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 a lot or uh, totally eliminating some of those consultants and replacing, up, re replacing them with staffers. We currently have a chief operating officer. Uh, we have a program and policy manager. Those are two of the existing staffers who you may know, Cody and Cody Hooven and, and Sebastian Soria. Uh, they are now permanent employees. Uh, we, we have hired uh, a director of regulatory and legislative affairs. She's on board, comes from, a, among other things, a, a, a CCA background. Uh, we also have engaged a director of power services. Uh, he will be here on August the 8th. Uh, we're out looking for a chief financial officer now, an energy uh, contract manager, uh, uh, and uh, let's see, uh, director of customer care and key accounts manager. So we're trying to fill in sort of across the board and then we'll build from there so that by the end of uh, 
the end of uh, next year, we'll have all of these boxes filled. So you can see uh, we're off and, and out uh, recruiting staff. Next. Well, our startup activities, of course, we, we adopted last week our initial rates, the very first rates that we're going to have in anticipation of beginning service March the 1st. Uh, structurally, they're structured the same as SDG&E. Uh, there is a differential in rates, and, and because our rates have been in the air and their rates are kind of in the air, we haven't really done a hard and fast comparison, and we intend to do that as soon as all those balls come down, uh, but we expect to be competitive. Uh, and but the rate structure itself uh, uh, is, is the same, so that there's no confusion. And it, it, uh, quite quite frankly, their system can adapt to that better. Next, uh, one of the things we we want to say is that when you when we do compare, so we let me just say this: we, we you, you don't make rates as a CCA based on what the competition does. You do it based upon what your needs are, what your revenue requirements are, and so that's where we started. We determined how much. Uh, we needed to, to operate our business, business, and then because customers have a choice and they're going to want to know what the competitor is, then we look over our shoulder and see how the how the uh, how the competition is doing. And uh, even though we haven't been able to do a direct comparison yet, we won't really be able to even then do a direct comparison because you can see the renewable levels in the two commodities, the commodity we're delivering and the commodity that SDG&E is delivering is different. Uh, their renewable contents 31%. Ours is our base model is 50%. So it's a much cleaner uh, model than theirs. So you would suspect that it has more value, uh, uh, and so we want want to make sure our customers understand that as well. Uh, next, uh, we have two rates. One's called Power On, and again, it's 50% renewable, and the other one is 100% renewable. And so what we've done is priced out uh, on our rates. Uh, uh, current rates or the new rates, uh, uh, the differences between those two. And I think a lot of people were surprised to find out there's only about $3 difference between a 50% uh, renewable product and a 100% uh, renewable product. So that was, a, was, I think, a surprise to folks. And this will be, will be, is on our website. So our customers will, will at least have some sense of that right now. So next, our, our, our website went live yesterday. So uh, feel free to go on and take a look at a little more about who we are. I think the other rate comparison that's kind of interesting is we wanted to know how we were doing with our other CCA peers. So this is about a half a dozen or so uh, of the CCAs in California. And you can see we're in the middle. We're actually on the, on the lower side rather than the higher side. So we feel pretty confident that our, our rates are in line with what we're gonna be able to provide. And we're, we're even though the, we're newer and some of the older ones are actually, uh, their rates are a little higher than ours. So uh, we feel good about that. Uh, next. Uh, so we're getting ready to launch. Uh, we've, we've started a marketing program. Uh, uh, this is uh, part of our website design. And, and uh, uh, you know, we've taken a look at how, uh, how we want to present ourselves. Uh, we have a new logo that we, we adopted a couple, of, a couple of weeks, a couple of months ago, I guess. Uh, so we, we have a new website next. We, uh, we, we have our letters ready to go out to the, the, the two notices that have to go out before services provided. And then there are two notices that have to go out after. Uh, these uh, were just finalized this week because we're the first batch is going out. If we're gonna start service March 1st, uh, we need to get those out as well. So uh, uh, this is what it's gonna look like. Uh, 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 as information and notice to the customers. Next, uh, outreach and engagement. We're actually have efforts underway for really all three phases. Uh, phase one is really right in our face and it's here and we've got media working. We, we've got uh, uh, briefings. We're, we're trying to get our, since this is uh, governmental uh, customers, we'll be briefing city councils and, and key, key folks in the various member cities. Uh, the next one, commercial industrial, gets a lot more difficult because that's that's a very diverse group and there's a lot of them. And so we're still working on exactly what is the most effective outreach kind of, kind of campaign. We're not just going to rely on the letter notices that are required by law. We're going to try to go above and beyond that so, so that we can uh, make sure we target uh, and, and cover uh, those folks uh, uh, 
who, who are important for us to retain. They're all important, but we want to make sure we give some personal treatment as much as possible to all our customers. And so we have plans for that. Once we get to residential, we're talking about all, you know, 750,000 people. So that's a totally different program than we have for phase one and phase two, but we have more time to work on it. So it's more in its infancy at this point. So, so that we're very, very busy working on, on these things as well. Next, I think that might be it. Yeah, that, that's, that's a very quick overview of, of who we are and where we are. And we'd be happy, uh, Cody's here also. If you ask me something I can't answer, she can answer it. Uh, she's been a key and integral part and will continue to be in our operations. And so uh, I would open it up if you have time or you want to, Barbara, for whatever, whatever you want to do. I would turn it back to the chair. Yeah, thank you so much, Bill and Cody. That was really informative and CEA really looks forward to partnering with you guys and sharing resources whenever we can. So yes, we do too. We're, we're here and um, I wonder if we might be able to get those slides from you. Would, would that be okay? Sure. Um, sure. Barbara has them. Yeah. To Barbara and um, I will open it up to questions. Does, does anybody board members have any questions? Comments? Board member Drucker. Yes, nice presentation, Bill. Um, the uh, residential rollout, January 22, um, are you thinking of moving that up or moving that back? Uh, we're thinking of moving it, well, it have to be, be how you look at it, forward or back. We're actually moving it downstream to uh, uh, June or July of that year. We're, we're delaying it six months more. And any specific reason why? Well, partly because uh, the winter months are not real high revenue months. In fact, there may be months that we lose money. And so we wanted, didn't want to start up in the middle of a, of a deficit situation for phase three. Uh, so we moved it downstream so we could hit the beginning of the summer months and it would help build our reserves, and help pay our bills. And we'd be in a lot better financial position to the tune of several million dollars. And finally, what uh, types of assumptions are you making in terms of opt-out rates? Well, I, I, you know, I don't know that we have a, an exact target. I, I think we're, we're perceiving that it's going to be low, like most uh, CCAs are, uh, under 5% or, uh, or thereabouts. And so I think we anticipate uh, uh, our experience to be the same. Uh, we don't expect any circumstances that would cause us to, to have a higher number than that. Great. Thank you very much. And, and can I just ask how you came to the 55% um, greenhouse gas free? Okay, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Cody. That was a debate that occurred before I came. Uh, we finalized it after I was here, but I'll, it, it's 50 plus five actually, which right. uh, yeah, I, I is, is well. quite frankly is a little confusing. And so uh, it does require some explanation. So I'll let her do that for you. Great, thank yeah. you. Yeah, thanks for the question. It has, it's been a struggle for us to figure out how to communicate that. And what we were striving for was the, the most renewable, of course, which you all know now the difference between renewable versus other carbon-free types of power from the state perspective and also state requirements. Um, so we needed to meet uh, a good amount of renewables to be competitive and to achieve state targets. We wanted to increase the amount of carbon-free um, power in our portfolio in order to help our member cities go further on their climate action plan and greenhouse gas reduction goals. So we thought, um, you know, if we could add a little bit more power in that's, while not renewable in the state definition, because that's the most expensive, we could add in some carbon-free power that helps with the greenhouse gas emissions. And that was the debate the board, our board had, gosh, back in the spring, and they landed on that. It's been tricky in marketing <laughs> to try to convey that to people, though. Got it. Okay. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed that presentation and I, we will work closely together. Thank you. Yeah, we, we look forward to it as well. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Great. Okay. Let's go on to the next presentation by San Diego Gas and Electric and talk about the Envision project update. Uh, thank you, Chair Becker. And we do have with us uh, to present to the board Another update, and this is from San Diego Gas and Electric on their uh, major project they have underway, which is their billing system replacement. We have Scott Kreider and Sabrina Butler who are here, and uh, I will turn it over to them. And uh, Scott, are you able to, um, did you, uh, do you 
have a presentation? No, um, since you asked me just to keep it about three minutes, I, I figured I would just do it verbally. Um, but Barbara, thank you very much. Uh, Chair Becker, thank you for the opportunity to provide an update uh, to, to the board. Uh, again, I'm Scott Kreider. I'm the Chief Customer Officer with SDG&E. And, &E. and um, again, appreciate the opportunity to provide a very brief update on the status of our new billing system. Um, and just to recap, um, you know, SDG&E has been engaged in an initiative known as Envision to replace all of our customer service systems, all of our digital account portals, and all of our, all, all of our billing system. Uh, and we've really been at this since 2017. And uh, just a little bit of context, a reminder, you know, this, this type of program is technically very complex and really only occurs for most utilities about once every 20 to 30 years. Uh, it just so happens that it coincides with the transition of, of two major CCAs in our region. And as you'll recall, um, I was uh, before the board um, last summer and uh, had described that we had originally planned to deploy the system in January 2021 but the Public Utilities Commission had made a decision requiring all types of new customer functionality. Um, and they voted on that in mid-2020. Uh, mid and it required us to delay deployment of this new billing system until April 2021 uh, to ensure that all these new requirements that the, uh, uh, the PUC put on us uh, could be added to the system. And you know, I think really since that time, um, you know, we between uh, CEA, SDG&E, SDCP, a lot of conversations uh, about this resulting delay, and we've worked very hard with staff. I uh, want to thank Barb and her team, um, and worked very collaboratively on a plan that really limits the impact on your transition plan, uh, even with a 90-day delay. And, but I do understand that there's always a lot of anxiety about uh, the status of Envision since schedule is so important to you. Um, quite frankly, it's very important to, to SDG&E. Uh, this, you know, this 90 day delay was unfortunately unavoidable. Uh, it was very expensive uh, for us. And so uh, schedule is uh, critically important to us, but we also know that you're also relying on it uh, for, uh, to be able to hit your launch dates and understand uh, the importance of that. So I am pleased to share that you know, the program uh, remains on track for an early April deployment. And um, I'm actually the officer in charge of the program in addition to being the chief customer officer. So I'm in this every day and uh, I'm, I'm confident that we're gonna stay on schedule. And we've actually been working to test all the interactions um, between SDG&E and your back office provider Calpine uh, to make sure that data is able to flow back and forth, that payment and financial processing uh, is, is, is going to work well, uh, in addition to really practicing even the customer transition uh, that will occur uh, later this spring. And so I just want to maybe close there by appreciating, you know, the ongoing collaboration with, uh, with the CEA staff, and we're continuing to meet very frequently. And, um, and, and really, in the end, we look forward to being your partners as we go through this transition uh, with their shared customers. Again, understand the importance to uh, CEA, obviously critically important to sdg and &E, and really important to the region. Uh, but uh, bottom line is I, I feel really good with where we're at and uh, look forward to uh, our launch in April. And with that, uh, Chair Becker, or, uh, Barbara, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much. Yeah, we really appreciate your um, working hard to keep our um, start date and we would love to be Good partners with you guys as well. So thank you so much. And thank you for coming today and presenting. Really appreciate it. Did anyone have any quick questions? No, nope, I don't think so. So we'll, we'll welcome and see you again. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, so let's go to, do we have any public comment for any items that aren't on the agenda? Um, is that, does Madam Clerk? I don't, maybe I guess I'll take take that as a no. And um, okay, I apologize. I was unable to unmute. We have no okay. one to speak. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so uh, we are now at the approval of the minutes. Um, I will go ahead and move approval of the minutes. Um, I know both of my other board members were not here for those minutes, but um, th they are allowed to vote on that. You're muted, Mr. Stepanovich. You're muted. 
Mm -hmm. All right, it's, uh, it is fine for the other two board members to vote on the minutes, even though they were not present at the meeting. Okay, I'll, I'll move, just anyone second? Um, Christy, uh, I was at the, at the meeting, the last meeting, and I, I, there are two comments that I have on the meeting. One, it, uh, it notates that I'm a council member from the city of Carlsbad, and it should oh. be the city of Del Mar. Uh, number two is on the uh, JP Morgan loan. It uh, does not uh, notate my recusal, and the, uh, the uh, motion passed two to zero rather than three to zero. Yeah, that's important to note. Very important, thank you. Okay, with those, with those cho choices. So I would, yes. I um, would second your motion to approve with those changes. Great, and can we call for the vote? Member Drucker? Yes. Vice Chair Batvatel? Yes. Chair Becker? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we are on the consent calendar. Does anybody, uh, want to pull any item on the consent calendar? Otherwise, I'll uh, do a motion. So, yeah, there's a member of the public that wants to pull anything, which just to confirm. Yeah, Madam Clerk, is there a member of the public that would like to pull consent item? There is not. Thank you. Okay, I just have one question about the debt policy. And I, the debt policy says that we're only to borrow for capital improvement projects, as far as I could read. Is that correct? Uh, thank you, Board Drucker. And we do have with us our special counsel, Mr. Rudy Sallow, and he did assist with uh, developing that policy to ensure it uh, follows current uh, practices. And I will uh, ask if he could respond to your question about restrictions of, of debt. Yeah, hi, this is Rudy. I'm sorry, my sincere apologies. I didn't hear the question clearly. My connection for some reason is not is, is poor. My apologies. Okay, so the, as far as I, when I read the debt policy, it specifically called out that debt is only to be issued for capital improvement projects, as far as I could read it. I'm sorry, I believe that was for long-term <laughs> debt. It was a long-term versus short-term um, debt project. So, um, I mean, in capital improvements is, is pretty broad, but uh, but it, it, long-term meaning anything that's longer than a year, um, um, and, and you know, fully committed uh, would be would is, is typically done for capital improvement projects. Uh, Short-term debt uh, can be can be for you know working capital, which is very similar to what you're doing. The the J.P. Morgan revolving credit agreement, which you're going to be approving this hour, excuse me, discussing this afternoon. I didn't want to be presumptuous there. My apologies. That would be considered short-term debt, and that's you know can be used for any type of uh, uh, agency purposes. But typically, governmental agencies uh, for long-term debt, it, it is usually for capital improvements. No, I, I totally agree with that. I, you know, just uh, the term of the JP Morgan is five years. So. Oh yeah. It, it, very good point. That, 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 that's the tenor of the underlying agreement, although it, it's a revolving credit agreement. So it can, uh, the, the, the amounts borrowed there under can be repaid back at any time. And so that would fall under the short term debt uh, definition. Okay. I just want to make sure but that we're not. No, great make, question though. Really good question. Yeah. Want to make sure we're not uh, following not following our debt policy. So I don't. I would move approval of the consent calendar. Second. Okay. Great. Can we call for the vote? Member Drucker. Yes. Vice Chair Bot Patel. Aye. Chair Becker. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. All right. We are on new business. Item number six the Clean Energy Alliance Interim Chief Executive Officer, Operational Administrative and Regulatory Affairs Update. I'll turn it over to you, Madam CEO. Thank you, Chair Becker. I don't have anything specifically to highlight from my report unless the board has any questions on that. Uh, otherwise, I will open it uh, up to our uh, special counsel, Ty Tosdall, to provide his update on regulatory issues since they are hot items and we have always have breaking news in that, that arena. Great. 
Thank you, Barbara. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Barbara, can I share my screen here? Yes, you should. You should have that capability. Okay. At the um, at the the bottom okay. portion there. Yeah, got it. Okay. Thank you. Give me one moment. Can everybody see that? Yes. Great. Okay. Um, well, good, good afternoon. Like I said, everybody, I wanted to um, discuss a few of SDG&E's uh, rate making applications currently pending before the commission, and then a couple of other items um, affecting the program. Um, as we've been discussing, um, SDG&E's uh, 2021 error forecast application has been uh, front and center uh, before us um, and uh, front and center on our agenda. Um, as you know, there are, there are several ups and downs with this proceeding. SDG was originally proposing a very dramatic rate decrease of uh, 12 to 13 uh, percent uh, system average. Uh, and uh, uh, along the way in the proceeding, we, you know, we discovered that part of that uh, decrease is being driven by reductions in departing load. I mean, uh, the um, omission of reductions in departing, uh, re reductions in the load due to the departing load, uh, customers joining um, STCP and CEA um, over the next uh, year. Uh, and so uh, we were able uh, with, a, you know, very considerable advocacy effort to uh, persuade the commission um, that uh, SDG needed to incorporate um, that departing load into its figures. So uh, last week, the uh, commission adopted um, a uh, an alternate proposed decision um, uh, that uh, said as much. Uh, so there, there's not going to be a drastic reduction in sdg &E's rates. Um, in fact, what we're anticipating an increase in their rates um, and the specifics are still to be worked out and we will receive um, we have, have been having some discussions with SDG&E and we'll continue to do that. And we will also um, be reviewing an advice letter that they're going to submit um, for rate changes in uh, March. Uh, so we'll have, uh, hopefully have some more information for you <clears throat> um, along the way. Um, we were also uh, glad to see that the commission adopt and adopted what was called the system average percent change allocation method which spread the rate increase uh, across uh, different uh, uh, rate classes uh, evenly. Uh, so that's important so that no one rate class is disproportionately affected by the, uh, by the uh, decision. Uh, so we, we will continue to uh, engage in these discussions with sdg &E over their, their rate adoption and we will uh, be um, informing you about that, um, but, uh, the upshot, you know, is that the uh, very problematic proposal that was put forward um, is was not approved, uh, and so we can have some um, greater confidence in the rate environment uh, going into CEA's launch. Um, so I, I know that's been a big topic for us, and let me pause there for a moment, see if there are any questions specifically about that before moving on. Oh, Vice Chair Bat Patel. Yeah, just briefly. So to clarify, you mentioned that um, the we would be anticipating to know a little bit more with regards to the increase in their rates by March. Is that accurate? Yes, correct. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we, we will report back on this uh, at, at the next board meeting um, and and give some more information, uh, if not uh, sooner. Um, I'll certainly be you know updating uh, Barbara, and she'll be involved with some of these conversations. Um, so Ms. Ms. Boswell will have additional information as this unfolds as well. So ha happy to you know answer any specific questions offline uh, should should they come up. So any other questions about SDG's era proceeding? I will I will just to remind everybody this is an annual proceeding. Um, especially for the new board members. Um, this is an annual proceeding uh, that will uh, take place each year. It's where the uh, uh, PCIA rate is set. It's where SDG&E's um, rate adjustments are made for the following year. And it's also where the um, eco-choice rates are set for SDG&E's uh, you know, green rate program. So very important proceeding um, that we'll be discussing regularly going forward. Thank you. 
Okay, great. Uh, moving along, uh, in addition to the uh, rate changes that were proposed in the uh, era preceding SDG, has also filed an era trigger application, uh, which they're required to do um, under the rules that have been put forth by the Public Utilities Commission. They've requested um, a modest increase. We have special counsel, era counsel working on this. Uh, Keys and Fox is the name of the firm. So we've been working closely with them. Um, we jointly submitted a protest with STCP um, earlier this month. Um, fortunately, SDG&E is committed to um, using the energy requirements that do incorporate departing loads so we don't encounter a rerun uh, of what happened in the, in the era preceding. Um, so uh, what we've been discussing is, a, is potentially a, a March implementation for this proceeding as well. So we'll, again, as this unfolds, have you know, additional inform information for you uh, at the next meeting. Uh, just a couple of other items. Uh, our 2020 RPS procurement plans, uh, the CCA programs like other uh, load serving entities, uh, utilities, and direct access providers are required to submit an annual RPS plan uh, showing their uh, progress uh, toward the RPS uh, requirements and goals. Uh, and like many other programs, um, at CEA um, is now required to uh, update and do some amendments to their plan. This, these, the RPS requirements have continued to be uh, grow more and more elaborate and uh, detailed uh, over time. Um, and so we have our very, very capable um, consultants at PEA working on the amendments to the plan and then, and then our firm will assist as needed. Um, so that, that just to give you an update, those are due on February 15th. Uh, and so we'll be working toward that goal. Um, the, I, I wanted to share this one uh, graphic with you all. Hopefully you can see that it's not too small. Um, but this came out of the um, proposed decision on the RPS plans, and it shows just at the um, system level the progress toward um, the RPS. So the, the, the top left chart is the um, IR, IOU progress towards the 60% RPS goal, and the, the bottom one, uh, on the bottom right, uh, is the aggregated CCA progress towards 60% RPS a um, couple things to note about these um, graphs is that it, it looks like in the 2028 20, time frame or so that uh, that uh, CCA programs on the current trajectory will be supplying as much RPS power as the utilities are will be at that time. So there's a you know parity coming forward um, in in the power, you know, supply, RPS power supplied uh, within the state, um, which is, I think, a good, a good uh, milestone to, to have in our um, minds. And then I think the other th important takeaway from, from looking at these graphs is that you can see that um, the, the blue areas represent online generation. So the utilities will be drawing on generation that's already under contract, already developed um, to meet their RPS requirements for the most part. Um, not the case for CCA programs. Um, they will have to um, uh, invest in new development and new projects um, in order to meet those goals. Um, so just a, an observation about the, the uh, trends uh, statewide. Uh, final item, I just wanted to um, notify you all that uh, there's some discussion about another um, low income protection type of plan. We had talked about the arrearage management plan that percentage of income payment plan is a, a similar type of program to assist people in um, you know, meeting the financial obligations of their utility bills. Um, this is early on in the process. There's a lot of disagreement. Um, Cal CCA is advocating for CCA interest in this proceeding. Um, and uh, are, they're recommending a pilot program. Um, and then if it goes forward, they've also recommended um, cost recovery mechanisms that would be uh, that CCAs would be eligible um, to draw upon as well. So, uh, so that concludes my report. I'm happy to answer questions about these or other regulatory matters um, that you may have. Thank you so much, Mr. Tostall. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, seeing none. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Um, Madam Clerk, did we have any public comment on item six? We have no request to speak. Okay, and, and I believe that there's no request to speak on seven, eight, nine, or 10, and it'll just be on item 11 that we have a public comment, so I won't bother you until then. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, great, thank you. All right, let's go on to item seven. Um, adopt resolution 2020-004, approving credit agreement with JP Morgan for $6 million startup and cash flow line of credit. Christy, uh, Dave Drucker, I need to recuse myself because I do have financial interest in JP Morgan Chase. Thank so I will you. turn off my video. Okay, great. Okay, thank you, Chair Becker. And I am sharing my screen and I just want to confirm that you can actually see it. Yes. And that it's moving. Not yet. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. Want me, it seems to always want me to stop and restart for some reason. Okay, I believe now you see it and it's yeah. good. Okay, so the item uh, before the board for consideration is the credit agreement uh, with JP Morgan that provides the uh, funding for our remaining startup costs as well as our uh, cash flow needs. And um, we've added some uh, recommended funding in there for contingencies. Specifically, we're asking the board to consider adoption of resolution number 2021-004, which approves the credit agreement in a form substantially as was attached to the uh, staff report with JP Morgan for a $6 million line of credit to fund our startup and cash flow needs and to authorize the interim chief executive officer to exec execute all documents subject to special counsel approval. And as mentioned uh, on the debt policy, we do have our special counsel from Nixon Peabody here with us in case the board has um, questions. In addition, we are uh, recommending approval of the fee agreement with JP Morgan related to the $6 million line of credit and to authorize the interim CEO or interim chief financial officer to execute all documents subject to general counsel approval. Uh, by way of background, the board uh, has had under consideration financing our initial startup costs uh, for quite some time, beginning with our RFP that was issued in February 20th, 2020. Most recently in December, the board did uh, uh, make final approval of moving forward with the credit solution with JP Morgan. And we're now at the final stage of approving the actual credit agreement. Uh, included in the credit agreement or in the staff report is a summary of our estimated costs related to this financing. Um, initially, uh, we had uh, estimated a need of, we were requesting approval for up to $5 million, uh, which was broken out amongst the various uh, categories of expenses. Um, subsequent to that, we were reviewing our cash flow needs and um, with, our, uh, with the uh, bank and determined that it would be prudent to include an additional $500,000 uh, for startup contingency and then $500,000 for energy supply contingency uh, based on where we are at with our, with our launch. Those funds, of course, would not be drawn upon um, unless needed. And uh, we would come before the board for uh, budget approval uh, for those funds. And so uh, they are there so that we are there available if needed. And uh, we would uh, seek board approval prior to tapping into those funds. In terms of uh, the annual estimated annual and total cost of the $6 million line of credit, uh, based on the, uh, the interest rate of uh, a one month LIBOR plus the applicable margin, if we utilize 75% of the $6 million, which is four and a half million, the annual cost would be 193,187, which represents the interest and costs on that line of credit. Uh, the total cost over the life of the facility is $1,047,000. If we were to, uh, and the, the estimated life is five years. 
if we were utilized the, the full amount, the full 6 million, uh, the annual cost then would be 214,583. And the cost over the life of the facility would be 1,154,414. We have included uh, those costs in previous pro formas that, that is within the amounts of previous pro formas that the board has seen. And uh, we do anticipate setting rates uh, that would provide sufficient funds to repay those costs over five years. Uh, it is uh, notable uh, that the, uh, the line of credit has no recourse to the member agencies. This is fully a debt of Clean Energy Alliance. And uh, in the unexpected, uh, if, it, if for some reason we were unable to, to pay that debt, which is not anticipated based on the covenants and rate setting, but if that were to happen, the bank could not go back to the cities uh, for that to recover those costs. The credit agreement as uh, proposed is based on the terms that were previously presented and approved by the board at its December 17th meeting. It does establish the terms and conditions related to that line of credit and the documents have been reviewed and uh, approved and we are still finalizing um, some of the language but they are substantially as to form uh, by our special counsel from Nixon Peabody. That does conclude my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions um, as well as uh, Mr. Sallow who is here from uh, Nixon Peabody if you have questions for him as well. Okay, thank you. So that extra million dollars that we added did not change any of the terms of the contract? It does not because the terms actually provided financing up to $15 million. Mm -hmm. um, so it does not change the terms. Okay. Vice Chair, do you have any questions? I don't know. Thank you. Okay. Would you like to move staff recommendation approval? Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to move it. Okay. And I'll second. Madam oh. Chair, can yeah. I have expense of butting in? I'm the designated alternate for board member Drucker, but I too have a conflict. So I'd like the minister to reflect that I am recusing myself as well. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Okay, so I, I second that motion and we can call for the vote. Vice Chair Battelle. Aye. Chair Becker. Yes. Thank you. And the minutes should reflect the QSOLs and extensions that have been added. Okay, great. And can we call back Board Member Drucker? He is here. Great. I'm back. Okay, great. We are on to item eight consideration of Community Advisory Committee meeting in February 2021. Turn it back to you, Madam CEO. Yes, thank you, Chair Becker. And I will. Once again, share my screen and are you able to see the presentation? We okay. do see it. All right, but I don't think it's gonna move. I'm, is it, it's not moving. No, no movement. Okay. <laughs> Technology is not my friend today. Okay, I think we're, we're in business here. Uh, this item is before you at the request of the Community Advisory Committee. And uh, we do have with us alternate board member Dwight uh, Morton. He is the chair of the Community Advisory Committee. And we held our first meeting in, of that committee in December. And uh, at that committee, the, the uh, committee did ask that the chair come before you to uh, request potentially meeting in February in order to provide uh, the opportunity to uh, learn more and become uh, more familiar with the program to be as uh, useful or uh, in assisting with our community outreach. Uh, the recommendation is that the board uh, either reschedule the Community Advisory Committee from March 2021 to February 2021 or approve uh, adding a special meeting in February of 2021. In addition, in reviewing the membership uh, and the policy, it was noted that we had a clerical error in establishing the terms of the initial of the community advisory committee members. And so we're also recommending that the board approve uh, the update and correction of the uh, CAC member terms. 
uh, as way of background, the the Clean Energy Advisory uh, Clean Energy Alliance Board did adopt our Community Advisory Committee policy in July, and that policy does set establish that the CA Board is to set the CAC meeting schedule and work plan, and the board did approve those in October 2025. I'm sorry, October 15th, 2020. The board established that the CAC would meet quarterly. Their first meeting was in December and subsequent meetings will be uh, quarterly after that with the next one scheduled as of the approved schedule is March, 2021. Uh, this is reflects the corrections to the uh, board terms. So they are uh, staggered, uh, they're, they're three year terms and to ensure the staggering the first uh, Half of this, the board uh, committee members have terms that end in 2022. So they would have a two-year term first and the others would be a three-year term. Uh, as discussed, the, the board did request, uh, uh, the, the committee did request the board to consider adding a special meeting in February. And again, the purpose of that special meeting would be to discuss uh, the community outreach plan to learn more about CEA in order to be the most uh, successful in, um, in the community outreach and assisting with, uh, with speaking to the public about uh, uh, Clean Energy Advisory, uh, Clean Energy Alliance. Um, there was also a request to establish subcommittees and that those subcommittees would work between uh, February and March to develop a recommendation um, related to the community outreach program. Uh, the community outreach, our current community outreach plan is that our communications team made up of uh, Trapepi Smith will be working on developing our community outreach plan, which will be brought to, would be brought to the community advisory committee in March for review and finalizing. And the uh, March meeting happens early enough in the month that then we would bring the final outreach plan to the board at its March 2021 meeting for review and approval. And we would then implement that outreach plan. Mm -hmm. And that does uh, conclude my presentation. And I would like to um, also uh, note that we have uh, the uh, committee chair uh, warden is available for questions and comments and he did provide a memo uh, with the formalizing the request and that was a part of your um, staff report. Okay, so going back to the changing of the terms, the, the dates, I do recall, didn't we appoint for one year and two year? The, the staff report stated one year, two year, but the policy itself had actually indicated uh, three year terms with the initial would be two and three year. And so the staff report was not consistent with the policy. Okay, so we didn't, the board didn't make that change that we wanted it to be uh, two year terms? The policy was not changed. Okay. Would this be the time to do that or, or do, is that just something that we just? Uh, I will uh, defer to uh, general counsel Stefanosic, but I believe what we would need to do if the board wanted to change the policy would provide direction to bring it back. That is correct. Uh, since the policy was adopted and that's not on the agenda today, this was just put on as a, as really a correction. Right, uh, I understand, but it, okay. We need to come back at the next meeting to do that. Okay, and I'm not saying we need to, but I think that was a major, um, you know, difference when we appointed the terms. It's interesting because I remember specifically doing a one year and a two year, and now it's two years and three years. But um, anyway, okay, that's that's fine. Um, so it does look to me like we do need to move that meeting up to February. Um, and I'm hesitant to add another meeting because of the cost, um, money that we do not have that was not in our budget and it's um, time for our staff and mainly our, our CEO to uh, you know, put these things together. And I'm wondering if maybe we could do the February and the March and maybe skip the June, would that make more sense? Uh, 
Um, Chair Becker, um, that certainly I think would be an option for us to have the February and then have the next quarterly meeting early. And, um, you know, if something were to come back, come up subsequent to that, we may, you know, come back to the board. But certainly if that's the board direction, we will we'll make that work. I think having the two meetings uh, closer together will help in um, the committee members becoming familiar with the operations and uh, being able to assist with uh, communicating to the public and answering questions and uh, with our outreach. Yeah, it'd be great to have them um, be up to speed and help us before launch. And then maybe we'll have a little bit more of a pause because I do believe you know one of their main goals is going to be when we have reserves for them to look into the special programs that would be benefit CEA and that would come way down the line. So, um, but I'm open to discussion. I don't know if um, board member warden, you wanted to add something about um, what you thought the needs were. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think the suggestion you just made is a good one. What this committee wants to do is to be helpful as we approach launch. And that's going to be brought to you, as Barbara just said, in March. Um, and the committee would like to meet in February, divide into subcommittees so they can meet weekly if needed, ground truth in the home cities, who are the appropriate people and what are the strategies that will work in each city for doing an effective outreach and bring that back by March so that it can be folded into the program. So I think they really want to meet in February and March. And if you wanted to move up the June meeting, uh, that would be fine. If we don't meet until March, we won't even be able to get started uh, mm -hmm. before the, this part of the program will be over. Right, so. I agree. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. And I am really excited how excited our, our committee is. They're very, they're very smart, eager. Um, so I'm happy about that. So um, any, any other board members, do you guys have a comment on this? Or um, I would entertain a motion of, Whatever you guys. Um, I, I think it makes sense for them to meet February, March. Um, a lot of their outreach work will be, for, you know, March, yeah. April, et cetera. Um, and they really don't need to be meeting then until uh, until uh, later on. So um, I would uh, move that we uh, ha let them have a special meeting in February, move the June regular meeting to March and uh, also that we uh, approve the, the changes in terms of the uh, terms. The terms. Right. And I'll, I'll second that and I agree with the changes made. Okay, great, thank you. Madam Clerk, could you call for that vote? Member Drucker? Yes. Vice Chair Bot Patel? Aye. Chair Becker? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. All right, item nine, fiscal year 2021-22 budget planning. Can I turn this back to you, Madam CEO? Yes, thank you, Chair Becker. And are the slides advancing? Yes, you did it. Oh boy, okay. Uh, the item before you for consideration is uh, to provide direction and input regarding the fiscal year 2021-22 staffing and consulting services. And that uh, input will then inform and uh, assist us with developing the budget that we will bring back to you for consideration in May. And it's hard to believe we're talking about 2022. Uh, currently, uh, the Clean Energy Alliance administrative operational and technical st support are provided by a combination of member agency support assistance and consulting services agreements. Uh, this uh, approach has provided and does provide uh, flexibility to adjust service levels to meet, um, to meet our needs and of course as funds are available. Um, Clean Energy Alliance has taken a lean approach to its administrative costs uh, with the, the uh, goal of minimizing the amount of uh, financing needed, but also to uh, uh, the focus is on uh, building reserves to ensure long-term financial stability and offering the lowest possible, most competitive rates 
and by keeping our costs that we have control over as low as possible, that does help us to be as successful as possible. We're now entering the next phase of CEA's, uh, of CEA, and we're moving from the uh, implementation phase into the operational phase with our launch starting in May of 2021. Um, for purposes of uh, touch point of where we are today, uh, the following services are, have been and uh, provided by the member agencies through existing reimbursement agreements. So we have existing agreements that whereby uh, services being provided by the cities of Carlsbad, Del Mar and Solana Beach uh, would be reimbursed by Clean Energy Alliance uh, within three years of our, of our launch or by May of 2024. Um, in 2021, the city of Carlsbad has been providing the interim board clerk. So our official board secretary, excuse me, board secretary is currently uh, provided through the city of Carlsbad. And they also provided board clerk uh, services for meetings, as well as record management. Uh, during this year, uh, the CEA did hire its own interim board clerk. So the board clerk services are no longer being provided. But they are providing the interim board secretary. And should the, uh, should the board direct that we continue that, then in 2021, it's envisioned that we would request Carls of the city of Carlsbad if they uh, have the ability uh, to continue that interim board secretary. We will uh, be including in our budget a recommendation to, uh, for Clean Energy Alliance to acquire its own records management system so we, uh, with the assistance of the interim board clerk, would be uh, taking responsibility for our own records management. So that would relieve some of the work that is currently done by the city of Carlsbad uh, clerk services staff. The city of Solana Beach had been, has been providing accounting services assistance. Uh, they had uh, the interim chief financial officer, Marie Bercuti was uh, the, the finance director for the city of Solana Beach. She has since retired and is continuing to provide interim chief financial officer treasurer services through and a contract, consulting services contract. However, Solana Beach staff does assist, provide accounting assistance with processing of payments. This does provide uh, a good internal controls to ensuring that we have sufficient our eyes on the spending of CEA's money and that money is being spent according to approved um, budgets and with proper authorities and will help to ensure clean audits like you heard um, today. And then uh, lastly, all three cities have been assisting with hosting of board meetings as the uh, board has uh, requested our meetings to um, rotate between the three cities of hosting. Uh, with our current state home orders, our uh, recent meetings since last March have been virtual. Um, however, the, the staff still does, um, the city that is on record as hosting does assist with broadcasting. And uh, we are in the process of transitioning that to Clean Energy Alliance communications team. And so uh, the burden of broadcasting our meetings will no longer be on the um, staff of the cities, but uh, but um, they do still assist with those meetings. We do envision at some point going back to in-person and uh, we would then uh, be looking at staff, their staff assistance for setting up their council chambers and we'll have to research how uh, we can do broadcasting from within their um, council chambers. In terms of administrative services being provided by consultants, uh, primarily, uh, that's related to uh, staff. We have the interim um, CEO position, which is my position being provided by uh, my company. Is uh, The company is Bayshore Consulting Group. And that, uh, is, uh, that term of that agreement expires on June 30th, 2021. However, it may be extended through mutual agreement between uh, the CEA board and Bayshore Consulting Group. In January, we did add the interim board clerk uh, to that agreement, and that also expires June 30th, 2021, and may be extended. 
Uh, we have uh, an agreement, consulting services agreement with uh, Marie Moran Burkuti for the interim CFO position. And that is uh, September through June, 2021. And is also uh, maybe extended. Our technical cons uh, support consultants are being provided by uh, Pacific Energy Advisors. We have two uh, agreements with Pacific Energy Advisors. These were uh, completed through two different RFP processes. The first engagement uh, was for providing regulatory compliance, long-term uh, renewable procurements, resource adequacy, and uh, update and maintenance of our pro forma. And that agreement is an annual agreement whose current term expires on June 30th. Subsequently, during this fiscal year, we did uh, add uh, a, uh, execute a second agreement with Pacific Energy Advisor, which adds the wholesale sale power supply services. So expanding beyond just the long-term renewable procurement into short-term renewable and conventional energy, as well as the rate setting support in energy risk management. That particular contract extends through 2023. Um, and that uh, the pricing for that is uh, somewhat contingent on item number one, and we would be uh, recommending to the board that you um, those services would not typically be done in house for a CEA our size or at this point in time. So um, it would be uh, we would recommend to the board you consider extending contract number one to have the same term as the second to provide um, consistency and the ability in the future to then do a single RFP uh, when we do um, when those when that contract does expire it provides efficiencies. Other operational support being provided through consultants. Uh, first is our uh, legal services. We have our general counsel services. Uh, Mr. Greg Stepanisich is provided through uh, Richard Swatson and Gershon Law. And uh, again, those uh, contracts expired June 30th, 2021. We have special counsel providing regulatory affairs support of, uh, through Tosdal um, APC. And we have our communications and marketing services, our, one of our uh, newer consulting firms we engaged in September, 2020. And uh, there's uh, that current engagement does expire June 30th, 2021, but may be extended uh, through mutual agreement. In looking forward to uh, operational uh, and thinking about what additional services we, we may be needing, and some of this you heard STCB talk about similar type um, positions, we would be uh, recommending that uh, we will be needing assistance in the area of procurement and contract management. Um, which would be to assist with managing both our energy and non-energy procurement activities. So while Pacific Energy Advisors does assist with determining quantities and types of energy to be, pro be procured and uh, takes the lead on the solicitations, they do then come back to Clean Energy Alliance to review the outcomes and provide auth authorization. And so we would need someone on staff to assist with those as well as to work with any non-energy procurement that we may have. So mail services, graphic services, um, any number of um, other activities that are not energy related. Uh, I would also recommend that uh, the next kind of position we consider or services we need would be a customer account services position that uh, provides account management of key accounts. So, outreach to our key customers. Um, as you heard, STCP is also thinking about that, talking to our business community, making sure that um, they're comfortable, they understand uh, our goals, how we compare with, uh, with sdg &E, and then uh, working with them to ensure that they um, are comfortable and remain our customers. They would also assist with developing um, customer programs and talking to residential customers who may have questions that um, Calpine isn't able to answer. Should the board determine they're interested in looking at hiring uh, staff in the coming, in the coming year, uh, we would recommend um, the board uh, then direct that we um, 
provide direction on um, office space. If we have full-time staff, I think we need to be thinking about office and space rent. We would also need assistance in recruitment. So we would need a recruitment services consultant to develop job descriptions, uh, do salary surveys and determine salary requirements, and then to manage those recruitments. Initial uh, positions to hire that you may consider kind of in the waterfall is uh, to hi initially hire a CEO and chief financial officer. And then the CEO would then um, be responsible for, would typically be responsible for adding the lower level staff of a procurement and contract administrator and customer account services position. Uh, those services could uh, be offered through uh, either uh, reaching out to the existing service uh, consultants to see if you know those agreements could be expanded. And we could uh, perform uh, uh, our RFP or seek uh, other consulting services that might be able to provide uh, procurement and contract administration and customer account services should the board determine it uh, wants to uh, fill those services through con currently through contracts. Um, and if that were the direction, then what, uh, what we would uh, recommend is that uh, you direct bringing back a staffing plan, that a staffing plan be developed during the coming fiscal year uh, that would then be worked on and um, implemented in the following fiscal year. And it could then be structured uh, based on what our final customer base looks like and what our available funds looks like. We currently don't know uh, what our uh, participation rate is going to be and what our revenues will be um, at this point since we aren't yet launched. So that may be a way to uh, postpone and um, make those per more permanent decisions and permanent hirings once we know more about uh, our position. So that does, that was a lot of information and concludes my presentation. And I'm of course happy to answer whatever questions you may have. Thank you so much. Um, do we have any questions? Yes, board member Drucker. Yeah, so Barbara, what is our current plan of attack for uh, customer service as we move into providing power to, uh, to our customers? We do have, we have engaged, um, not engaged, we have a contract with Calpine Energy Solutions. And as part of that contract, they do provide call center services so the majority of our, our customer contact will be through that call center. Uh, they are the same call center uh, uh, firm that offers, provides those services to Solana Energy Alliance. So there will be a consistency there. They do a great job at responding to 99.9% .9 of calls that customers might have on their bill. However, they don't do um, one-on-one -on -one outreach to specific customers. They really are more of the call center type services. And uh, typically a CCA, in addition to having that call center, would have key staff that um, for the, the larger customers uh, who we want to, um, we need to, to have, I guess, more of a one-on-one -on -one relationship with. Uh, and that would be what's envisioned with the uh, customer account services. Person. Thank you. Great, thank you for that. Um, so I, I have really enjoyed our lean and mean approach to staffing and I've been extremely happy with um, the staff that we have. And um, so I am willing to um, move forward if, if um, with the staff that we have with and postpone um, any of these big decisions until we find out what, what kind of financial situation we're in um, and all that type of stuff. So, um, all right, Vice Chair Bhatt Patel. Yeah, I actually had that same note that just based on, um, I know this is my first meeting, but based on what I read and had the opportunity to ask during my briefings, I feel that um, this, that going with the lean approach is definitely going to be more uh, favorable for us. And uh, I would definitely agree that revisiting it after we've had the opportunity to see where we're at financially, we can then figure out whether or not we want to move forward with staffing at that point. So I agree with you on that. Great. Board Member Drucker. 
Yeah, I also would agree. I think the other condition really is, is that we, over the next six months, we do not want to change any horses. Um, we're we're going to be in, you know, basically having to, uh, you know, this is the biggest step the CEA is going to be taking right now is onboarding people. The only, you know, caveat I have on that is whether or not we need to up our customer service and, and maybe, you know, provide, you know, have that customer service rep. And uh, the other initial is procurement, um, you know, Priya, you've been working with us on NCTD and, uh, you know, procurement becomes this huge, um, complicated type of uh, system. And we need to probably, you know, move that up uh, in terms of having somebody procuring, you know, working on procurement. But, you know, again, everything's got to be focused on uh, bringing the customers on between now and June. And anything else that we do has got to be subsidiary to that. Right. Okay. And I did hear, um, Madam CEO, did I hear that right? That you were going to be working on getting um, those positions filled if we authorize that? Uh, if the board direction is that uh, you're interested in seeing what opportunities there are to fill those on a contract basis or by expanding services of and existing contracts, we will certainly work on that and then bring that to the board uh, likely in April and then uh, get your direction of whether or not that's uh, you're comfortable and we want to move that way uh, for um, budget purposes and also for then amending contracts to come back. I, I would agree that it would be best to modify contracts at this point. Okay. All right, so we need a motion for that, I imagine. Do you have enough direction? Yes. Okay, so would you like to make the motion, Board Member Drucker? I would uh, move that uh, we continue on the, the, for the initial 2021-22 budget that it be based upon current staffing levels um, and uh, contracts with the amendment of looking at bringing on or contracting for more customer service and procurement assistance. Second. All right, Madam Clerk, could you call for the vote? Drucker? Yes. Vice Chair Bat Patel? Aye. Chair Becker? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you for that. Okay, item 10, we're going to review and update Clean Energy Alliance Board Outreach Assignments Matrix. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Becker. And I will, let's see if, I think we have success. Great. Okay, so I have, uh, here is the uh, uh, Board Outreach Matrix, which uh, identified who the primary contacts would be for um, potential local cities that the that may be interested in joining CEA or that CEA may be interested in reaching out to uh, gauge interest in them joining. And uh, back in um, the fall of 2020, we did identify with using existing uh, board and alternates at that time, specific uh, uh, primary contacts and then uh, uh, staff contact to go along with that for um, cities as they were grouped, as you can see. And uh, now that we've had some changes in the makeup of our board, it's before you for consideration of reevaluation and updating. And I will turn it over to uh, Chair Becker. And uh, if you'd like, we can keep this up on the screen for discussion purposes or take it down, whatever your pleasure. That would be great. So it, it, would it be okay to have some of our alternates um, be assigned to some of these then? And it looks like that that is okay, right? Yes, it is. Okay, so, um, okay, I should we just go through and maybe I can just say, I think um, I'm, I'm willing to go with the San Diego County still. Um, and, uh, maybe what I, I would, maybe what I should do is take over, um, Mayor Hall's 
but maybe put the San, but the uh, San Diego County up there and maybe move Oceanside down. I don't know why, but it seems that maybe, maybe let me hear from the other board members. Yes, um, I would say it, at this point, I have made a reached out to a Tara Lawson Reamer's um, staff. Um, they are going, you know, Tara Lawson Reamer is going to be putting uh, along with uh, I think it's uh, Supervisor Gonzalez, um, a uh, policy about climate change that's going in front of the council, uh, supervised board on Wednesday. But I have reached out to her. I'm trying to set up a meeting between uh, Tara's staff and uh, Barbara so we can chat about their, uh, their um, eventual participation with us because I think that's would be really important. I, you know, the, I guess there's a couple questions here is, one is uh, how quickly do we wanna bring people on? Um, and is there a priority? I think San Diego County is probably the biggest priority, but uh, is there other priorities um, and, and other, or is there low hanging fruit, shall we say? Um, you know, Lemon Grove probably isn't one of the, uh, the places that is going to make a whole lot of changes because of their fiscal crisis at this point. Um, you know, I'd be happy to, you know, again, I, th I think we, you know, we have the ocean here. I think we need to figure out uh, who we really can uh, knock off because I assume we want to get more of these uh, cities and, and the county in involved with us. Is that correct? That's correct in my view. Yeah, I think we'll take anybody we can get. And, and you know, I think it's worth, um, uh, Madam CEO, telling us the timeline because it is it's quite confusing and and people don't really realize it. So could you go over that one more time? When people could actually any of these cities could actually enter, even if they came on board in this year? Yes, thank you. I was uh, that is relevant to the discussion. So in order for a uh, the, the timeline for implementing a CCA is very prescriptive by the California Public Utilities Commission. Um, in order for CEA to expand and uh, add, add new cities, um, we can do, go through the process to add them to the JPA, I think, at any time. However, in order, uh, in terms of when the CCA would actually launch, we would need to update our implementation plan and file that by the end of the calendar year. So if we had a, a city or a county interested in joining, then we would uh, update our implementation plan and that would need to be filed by December, 2021. And then the soonest that they, we would be able to launch our CCA in their territory is 2023. Um, it does take uh, some time to uh, prepare the, the implementation plan document. So working backwards, uh, it would be uh, best if we had identified a community interested in joining by early summer, June, July timeframe, um, in order to then request the data from sdg &E and do the analysis, prepare the analysis, the resulting impact to our pro forma of adding them to our operations, and then make the determination of moving forward and updating and filing the implementation plan. So it would seem that uh, to be practical about this, we need to reach out to each one of these to see if there's any um, desire of making a decision by December, the end by December. Um, and once we have that, you know, like let's say Escondido says, nope, we're not gonna make a decision until, uh, you know, December 2022 or something like that, then we would take them off the list uh, versus San Marcos who may say, yeah, we will consider it and we'll think about it. Then we need to do a little bit better job of lobbying and advocating for that. Um, so I think, you know, it behooves us, you know, to at least make some uh, initial um, reach out to each one of these at this point and uh, see if there's any interest at this point so uh, also, do we need to find out which of these cities has done the, their feasibility study? Do we know that information? 
I, I don't know who has an actual feasibility study. I, I would say that, um, of course, that would be good information to have, but we would still want to uh, request the most current usage data from SDG&E and then update our pro forma based on our actual real costs and uh, rates. Their feasibility study would be would have been based on a certain set of assumptions that may not necessarily match where we're at today. I see. Okay. So that so that didn't matter. Okay. Okay. So the bottom line is, let's do reassign yeah. these, and um, I'll just wait till the end, and I'll take what you don't want. But I've also got my alternate board member, Dave Zito, who's who um, would volunteer for some as well. I guess I have uh, Dwight on the line too. So, um, you know, I'd be more than happy to work with uh, with Escondido, and uh, where else? I guess Vista. I'm just thinking of where I have contacts, and uh, and San Marcos, and I I would like to you know continue to work with the County of San Diego if possible. Okay, so that's four right there. And um, Vice Chair, do you have any preference of what would be good for you? You guys are a little bit closer to Orange County, but is there, um, do you have any sure, I'm, I'm. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely know some folks in San Clemente and Dana Point, um, and I believe in San Juan, so I'm happy to do that. Um, or whatever, whatever anyone want, doesn't want, I'm happy to do that too. <laughs> so I think that would be a great one for you, though. That the Orange County group. So sure, you take that. That would be great. Um, so it looks like we have Oceanside, um, Oceanside, Santee, Poway, and El Cajon, Lemon Grove, and National City. Um, so we have um, alternate board member Zito here. Are, are any of those of interest to, to you? Oh. Sorry. Um, yeah, I'm happy to take any in San Diego yeah. County that others don't want to talk talk to that are that people need to talk to. I know most of them through my San Diego role. So. Okay. Does any, did any of those spark any interest of Oceanside, Santee, Poway, El Cajon, Lemon Grove, or National City? Um, again, I'm happy to take any or all of them relative okay. to what you might want to do. Okay. No, I'm trying to get them all doled out so I don't have any left for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, okay. So let's go. We've got our alternate board member warden here too. Maybe he knows, has some great connections if he's there to, um, and wants to. I am here and uh, I'm like uh, Dave Zito. I will fill in wherever you would like me to. I have some contacts in National City and I'd be very happy to help Dave approach the county because I have some contacts there. Okay, great. Would you want to just throw Lemon Grove in there as well? Sure, if you want me to. Group. Those were two were grouped together. Okay, great. So, so between... Um, so we've got left Oceanside, Santee, Poway, and El Cajon. Do you want to just group those in between myself and my alternate? Sounds good to me. Okay. Did we cover all of them? Yes, I believe we did. Okay, so can we uh, make a motion at, to that effect? So moved. <laughs> oh, great. And a second, and I just, before we call for the vote, I do want to mention that I had such a um, generous offer from the Sierra Clubs um, that they would actually get involved to help us with our outreach as well. Um, so let's keep them on, on board. And um, I know that our Attorney Tostall has generously offered his time as well. So we've got lots of help out there. So let's try to make a move. Um, I think our, we, we needed to do this be before June or July of 2021. Is that right? Ms. Becker, may I briefly make a comment? Yes, please. Great, thank you. 
Uh, Ms. Becker knows this, and I think Ms. Boswell knows this too, but just so everybody else knows, um, I, I pr previously with my prior firm um, uh, dedicated a lot of pro bono time to assist with uh, CCA formation efforts, and we're happy to do so again. So um, to the extent uh, you set up presentations or meets um, and you expect those to get into you know, some of the regulatory issues or just some of the more complex questions around CCA formation or programs, um, we, we'll, we'd be happy to um, attend those, participate, um, and you know, make presentations or, or participate in calls or, or meetings as, as needed on a pro bono basis. So um, please don't hesitate to ask. We'd be glad to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that help. And I wonder if it might be worth it to have just a little cheat sheet for, um, you know, you said that you were going to put together that PCIA uh, frequently asked questions. So that would be a helpful document. And then maybe just another little cheat sheet of the benefits, um, highlights, and that type of thing would be helpful if someone put sure. that together. Okay. No problem. Great. Okay, great. So we had a, a motion and a second. Um, could we call for the vote? Member Drucker? Yes. Vice Chair Bhatt Patel? Aye. Chair Becker? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. All right, item 11, approve Clean Energy Alliance default and optional power supply product offerings to be available at launch. Thank you. So the item before the board uh, currently for consideration is uh, the Clean Energy Alliance power supply product offerings. And this is uh, to determine which products we will offer at launch. Of course, down the road, the board has discretion to, to change their product offerings or add product offerings, but we're specifically talking about what we will be uh, planning for an offering uh, initially. The re recommendation is for the board to approve CEA's default and optional power supply product offerings to be available at launch to include our uh, green impact, our 50% renewable energy product, which has been established through the JPA agreement as the minimum renewable energy for our default power supply that customers will be automatically enrolled in. Um, to consider uh, a 50% renewable and increasing up to 75% greenhouse gas free product as an optional default for member agencies to select as a default power supply. And that would mirror what is currently provided to Solana Energy Alliance customers as a default. And that we also offer a 100% renewable energy product that would be available for member agencies to select as their uh, default power supply. So member agencies could, uh, could uh, those city councils could provide direction that they want their customers to be enrolled automatically into that higher renewable energy product. And that it be, that product be made available as an opt up uh, product for individual customers whose a community is uh, enrolled in the lower, in the 50% renewable. And we're also seeking direction regarding the local impact program offer offering that was discussed at the last meeting and provide direction on um, developing criteria for customer eligibility. Uh, uh, for uh, background, at the last meeting on December 17th, C the CEA board did uh, consider power, the following power supply options. Again, it, just as was, uh, reiter was discussed, we have a 50% renewable energy product as our minimum default power supply. Uh, there was discussion about the 50% renewable, 75% greenhouse gas free product as an option, optional default, and then the 100% renewable energy that would be an optional default uh, energy product and a voluntary opt up. There was also discussion revolving around uh, another option or program, uh, which would be uh, made up of renewable energy content would meet minimum state standards. The state standards do change, increase every year. In 2021, the standard is approximately 36%. It increases to 39% in 2022 and continues to increase from there. And uh, customers who met the eligibility criteria would have the option to opt down to that. Um, it was discussed uh, that potentially it would be restricted to 
residential customers currently enrolled in the low income discount program, CARE and FARA, which are administered through San Diego Gas and Electric, and also potentially small businesses. At that meeting, the board did uh, uh, provide direction to uh, reach out to each of the city councils of our member agencies to get input with regards to our power supply products. Uh, we did uh, meet with the, um, make a presentation to each of the city councils and uh, received feedback from those uh, member agencies. The city of Carlsbad discussed uh, the, the product options that, uh, that were are under consideration. They did uh, take a vote and they, uh, the city council supports offering the green impact, the 50% renewable energy product also offering, making available the 50% renewable, 75% greenhouse gas free product and the 100% renewable energy product. Carlsbad did not, the city of Carlsbad did not, city council did not support uh, the local impact um, product offering. The city of Solana Beach uh, was interested in learning more about all of the options. They would be, they're interested in learning more about what are the overall costs to CEA for those four options, what the proposed rates would be and how they compare to sdg and &E, and the, the impact to CEA's pro forma uh, for each of those four options. So they didn't uh, select or eliminate any of the options. They are still open to learning more and keeping open those uh, four products and looking, researching more about them. Uh, the city of Del Mar, uh, in their consideration, um, the feedback was that they felt it important to keep it simple and not have too many options that might be confusing to customers. Uh, that we should be sensitive to customer costs and uh, being comparable or competitive with SDG and E. Um, there was a comment made that it's essential that we uh, provide a product offering that would be affordable, and um, that if we were to offer the local impact program because it is a lower renewable uh, energy mix that, that would be going backwards and that would not be um, that would not be the direction that uh, that they would want to see and there were also um, comments made of concerns of vi overall viability of clean energy alliance in terms of uh, next steps uh, once the board provides direction then we would um, take the take that information regarding the power supply and the renewable mix and analyze that for impact to our pro forma. We will then be developing rates based on those uh, power supply options and bring that back to the board at our February 18th meeting. Uh, I, I would say that meeting, that date is critical because we are uh, required to send customer notices related to our May launch in the month of March, 2021 and we'll want to have our rates set <clears throat> and be able to have our comparisons with sdg and &E at the time that we're uh, sending notices to customers so customers can make informed decisions with regards to the options before them and whether or not they uh, want to opt out. And that does conclude my um, presentation and I'm happy to answer whatever questions that the board may have. I do have a question I wanted to clarify. So if we make some choices today to say, um, let's just go with all four of those products at the moment so that you can put those into the pro forma so that we could see what those numbers mean. Um, at the February 18th meeting, would we be able to say, oh, it looks like this product didn't make sense and eliminate that product at that meeting? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. It, you know, that certainly is something we could do, although I think it's not the most uh, efficient and it makes rates, our, our rate setting process a bit more difficult because we would need to de develop rates for all of those various scenarios. I think uh, if the board could narrow them down to even, you know, just the three or um, provide direction on the low local impact that maybe we can develop a program related to that and focus on what are uh, what are not uh, products that would require specific eligibility, but more what are our 
base products. I think that would be helpful in our rate making and being able to bring back to the board um, good information in February. Okay, but I guess the thing that, that I don't see that we have information on, or maybe you know this, whether or not um, the pro forma would reflect that the 50% renewable versus 50%, 75% carbon free, would that difference just sort of be negligible, would you say? We had, uh, I'll make sure I'm not muted. Um, we did do some initial look into that and the incremental cost going from 50% to 75%, I think is not so significant that it would change the rates. I think it's reasonable uh, for the board to provide direction that we uh, create rates based on the minimum 50% renewable and we return with some cost information and we could have some general information on what the, if there would be any impact to the rates by having uh, the 75% greenhouse gas free, that additional incremental increase in the carbon free. Um, I think that um, we could bring that back to the board. Okay. Okay. Those are my questions for now. So before we take any comments, do you, do the other board members have questions? I think we have public comment on this. Yes, we do. I was going to take your, would you like to have the public comment? Yeah, the public comment first, please. Yeah. Let's go ahead and do that. I think we have two of them. Yes, the first one is from Micah Mitrovsky um, from IBEW 569. And he says, I am submitting these comments on behalf of IBEW Local Union 569 regarding potential Clean Energy Alliance product offerings. We support the minimum 50% renewable and 100% renewable products. Revenue generated from the premium in the 100% product can be set aside in a fund dedicated to local programs and projects in the service territory. Local investments linked with job quality standards and community benefit agreements, prioritizing communities of concern can bring much needed economic and environmental benefits to communities most in need. We are concerned to see a proposal for a minimum state renewable portfolio standards product. In the December staff report, CEA staff noted this is 36% in 2021, increasing to 39% in 2022. This is the wrong direction for our region and our climate. It is also concerning to see a proposal for a 75% carbon free product. Carbon free can include nuclear or large hydroelectric resources, prioritizing local renewable energy products here in our region that are truly clean and renewable will maximize local job creation and economic benefits. We urge you to reject the minimum state renewable portfolio standards products and the 75% carbon free product and move forward with the 50% and 100% product offerings as referenced above. Thank you for your consideration. The next comment comes from Carl Aldinger um, and he's conservation organizer of the Sierra Club of San Diego. And he writes that on behalf of the Sierra Club of San Diego, I would ask that given the discussions at the three council meetings and the strong support discussed in those meetings to adopt the best greenhouse gas solutions with these product choices that the board not adopt the local impact 36% product offering and instead keep the 50% and 100% offerings. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, board member Drucker, did you have a question? No, sure. just to, I'm ready to comment. Okay, well, how about, did you have a question, Vice Chair? I, I did, yeah. So um, for for Ms. Boswell, um, could you please explain with regards to, because I know um, from the city of Carlsbad, we were not too keen on having the local impact uh, piece of it. And so I was just wondering if you could explain a little bit more about a potential program that would be in uh, in place of that in, instead of us offering that up as a potential option? Yes, um, thank you for that question. So uh, the, the local impact as it was um, discussed at the last board meeting, the board uh, 
was discussing potentially establishing specific criteria and eligibility. So it wouldn't be a generally open to everyone product, but uh, tailored to meet uh, specific um, customers who meet specific eligibility. If it's something that the board had interest in, the board could establish criteria beyond just what which customers could be eligible. The board could determine that the, the product actually be a program that has a specific term length. So if the board had a reason that it wanted to offer it, um, for example, for a specific period of time, um, I think there was discussion at one of the cities that you know, we're not in normal times right now with COVID and the economic Im impacts and that we wanna be sensitive to that. If the board were interested, we could develop something that was more along the lines of a program as opposed to a standard product offering available that we could then develop a criteria and also a term length. And then that program when customers apply for it, uh, they would be aware of how long it would be in effect and that it had a would have a specific cutoff. So if the board, uh, if that was something the board was interested in, that that could be a way to approach it, and not offer it as a as a standard um, product necessarily. Thank you. Yeah, I would just be curious to hear um, thoughts from my fellow board members around that. I know um, we had provided that direction, but I I would just be curious to hear what you all have to say around. Um, that particular option, the local impact option. Okay. I have some comments, but did you want to go go ahead, board member? Go ahead, Christy. Okay, well, first of all, I wanted to thank the speakers. Um, we had IBEW and Sierra Club, and they've 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 I think come to all of our meetings with comments, and I really appreciate that. Um, I do want to address the IBEW speakers' comments. Um, First of all, re regarding using um, revenue generated from the premium in the 100% renewable product and setting it aside for a certain dedication, that is um, it's a misunderstanding of the product pricing. The pricing is set to recover the cost of the 100% renewable power. And thus it's not a premium that is meant to generate excess revenue. Number two, the proposal about the 75% carbon free product um, CEA and SEA has stated that they will not purchase nuclear energy. So that is not on the table at all. And while um, it does include large hydro, which is 100% um, carbon free energy, um, and it's not local, but uh, local investment and job creation is important. They're both goals of the CEA. And we are trying to work diligently to meet those um, goals, but our organization needs to start somewhere and launch with existing clean power supply and um, that it, we need it to meet our, the needs of our customers. And finally, the proposal for the minimum state renewable portfolio product, it does meet other CEA goals, which are um, to maintain competitive rates. And I think we do have a responsibility to consider all of the options and balance our goals to the extent that they are in conflict. Um, so I guess just, I, I stated this at my city council meeting, but just for my colleagues here today, I do wanna explain why I would even consider the um, local impact program. Um, I am in favor of uh, taking a, a real good look at that just because I do believe launching our CEA today is a lot different than it was two to three years ago when SEA launched, mainly because of this pandemic that we're in. It's caused an economic downturn for a lot of businesses and a lot of residents. And also we've seen that sdg &E's PCIA charge has gotten to the point where it's absolutely impossible for CEAs to offer the 3% um, rate discount, which is what SEA started with, launched with. So in fact, even our default product might, the, the PCIA charge might cause the bills to increase. So, you know, I think there's a balance here that, you know, we all agree we're in a climate crisis and um, we have to balance those goals. And that's why I think that I'm grateful that um, our CEO did come up with some kind of creative, um, flexible uh, programs. And again, we can limit this 
um, program for a year. Um, what we don't want to do, I mean, I heard some, some people talk about, well, they can just opt out. Well, that's the last thing we want. We don't want large uh, people opting out. If we let them opt out here at the beginning, we're never getting them back. So in my view, it's better to have a temporary program that keeps as many small businesses and as many uh, disadvantaged communities as we can and have that limit for the first year or so when uh, we're getting back on our feet. Um, I also think that this local impact program may be a, a selling point to some of the other cities. Um, could be Vista, Escondido, some of these other cities that might have had um, you know, some really economic downturn as well. It might be something that they might um, be interested in. So I think that's a good um, encouragement or an attraction. So hope to get out of that quickly. But again, I think there's a fiscal responsibility to go ahead and look at that. Um, also, I think that you guys are interested in learning why uh, Solana Beach is so interested in keeping that 75% um, greenhouse gas free. Um, you know, we did launch with that and we have a lot of members in our community that are um, very, very, uh, you know, environmental leaders and, and they, they do feel strongly that, um, you know, that's the better product. And what my hope is, is that it is not, um, the cost for that versus 50% greenhouse gas free is not that different so that, my hope is that maybe all three of our cities would, would use that as our default product. And, and I just feel it's buttressed by the presentation we had by San Diego Community Power that they actually have 50% renewable, 55% um, carbon free. So I know we're not in competition with them, but it might be just a plus that we're, you know, we've got that going for us too, that we're actually cleaner than, than, SDCP. So um, those were my um, thoughts. So I guess what I, I, I'm hearing today a tiny bit of a difference that we are, the local impact would not be really one of our products so that it would just now move to a side program. Is that what I'm hearing? So that when we're listed in our website, let's say our products uh, would it not, wouldn't list that as sort of an opt-down provision. It would be some other way that they would, we would get um, maybe the disadvantaged communities to steer into that. Is that correct? That's certainly an, an option that the board could provide direction on and we could, it could be managed that way. So it would be a program that uh, customers would apply. Uh, we would make it as easy as possible to go through online and make the, you know, LGB requirements I think simple to administer, but um, it would not be an opt down button necessarily, but a, a, a another process, which we would need to do, do either way because we're limiting, we're not opening it up to the general uh, community. It, the discussion was limiting it to only certain customers who met the criteria. Exactly. Okay, but so am I understanding that today we could move forward, let's say, is, is if everybody else was in favor, of looking at the 100% renewable, the 50% renewable with 75% greenhouse gas free product and the 50% renewable product and then decide, well, I, actually maybe I don't need to have that answered. I, I can hear from my colleagues, but I do believe that there's, it would be um, beneficial to have, um, instead of the 50% renewable be the be default program, the 50% renewable and 75% greenhouse gas free be the default product. And I'll, I'll, um, it, I'd be interested to hear what, what my colleagues think on that. Go ahead, board member Drucker. Yeah, so um, I would agree that in terms of local impact, that probably should be some type of program that we can institute um, rather than having that quota choice. The way this many of the citizens in Del Mar are going to look at this is they are going to say, how does this bill compare to what I'm paying currently for San Diego Gas and Electric? And they're, you know, if they see any type of differential, they are going to opt out. Um, you know, there are some people, um, just like in Solana Beach, that are going to be, uh, that are, that very much want to, uh, to support, uh, 
the concept of more renewable energy, but I think most of the people in Del Mar are going to look at this as a fiscal choice. And so therefore, um, you know, the default for Del Mar will most likely be anything that is really close to what SDG&E is charging. Um, so, you know, I'm more than happy to have 50% to 50% renewable plus 75 and the 100% renewable as being our three, three options. Um, is somehow we need to make the green impact um, equal to the current, everybody's current bill. Otherwise, there's, there's, you know, I, I'm really worried about the opt out rate. And, uh, and again, you know, most of the people, you know, very few people in Del Mar are going to be uh, under the residential care FARA. Um, but I think it's important that we have something for the small businesses because uh, 99.9% .9 of the businesses in Del Mar are small. There's only one. And I don't know if the fairgrounds is going to be part of our catchment area anyway. So are you saying you want to direct staff to put together um, some criteria for the small yeah. business to um, see if they would qualify for that local program? Yes, definitely. Okay, okay. Vice Chair. Sure, happy to chime in. I know that um, when we talked about it at the city level, uh, I know that I was not necessarily for the local impact after hearing the feedback from my uh, fellow colleagues here. I'd be interested, uh, you know, as we mentioned, having the green impact, clean impact, and uh, the option of the 50% renewable and 75 GHG free as the um, options that we provide. And then the, as, as a program, having that local impact um, would, would make sense to me for sure. I think the only, you know, obviously the caveat for me has been, and this is something that I mentioned during the city council meeting also is just, if there is a way, and I'm sure as we navigate this, I, I believe we mentioned, and maybe chair Becker, you mentioned this as a potential that maybe, uh, we have a program for a year and then we revisit at the, at that time. Um, for me, it would be very important to see how we can then, um, if at that point there are options where we can figure out how to get folks transitioned into whatever our default option is, um, you know, whether it's in a year or a couple years, but I feel like it's something that we need to think about. And hopefully other C, uh, CCAs across the state have figured out options to make like a sliding scale for uh, more of the renewable energy options that we're providing. So that's that's the only comment I would like to make um, since I do still strongly believe that we wanna go, uh, the intent of a CCA is to be, you know, the to provide that renewable energy, but at the same time, being mindful of the situation of a pandemic and being mindful of making sure that folks have the opportunity to still um, purchase this particular, you know, purchase cleaner energy. Uh, yeah, I'd be, I'd be open to that. Okay, so it sounds like we, okay, do you have enough direction, Madam CEO, or um, it sounds like we're in favor of three products moving forward and then one program? Yes. Okay, great. And somebody would, would like to make the motion? Yeah, I, would, I would make a motion that we, uh, the performa be based upon uh, the three, um, Green impact, 50% uh, renewable, 75 greenhouse gas, and the clean impact, and then some type of program that uh, subsidizes or or provides a uh, rate relief, shall we say, for small businesses and low income. Second. Can I just say, are you concerned, Madam CEO, that we at some point might need to merge the 50% 75 with the 50% if we look at those numbers or? I think we have good direction um, okay. with the motion and can bring back uh, rates and information for the board's um, consideration as, okay. as it's currently. And we can hold, hold off with the naming yeah. if we need to. Yeah. Okay. That's good news. Okay, thank you. Uh, Madam Clerk, could you call for the vote? Member Jerker? Yes. Vice Chair Bot Patel? Aye. Chair Becker? Yes. Motion carries. Great. Okay, wow. 
We are now at board member requests for future agenda items. Vice Chair Bob Patel. Yes, thank you. Uh, so as I was mentioning earlier, um, I sit on both uh, this committee and North County Transit District, which are at the exact same time of the month. And so I was hoping that we could consider at our next meeting a conversation around changing the time for our committee as this one has less uh, member members uh, than the North County Transit District. Not for long. <laughs> yes, not for long. Hopefully we'll have as many as they do. <laughs> so are you, I, I know we're not supposed to discuss it, but I just wanted to clarify with a question. You're, you're proposing moving it either to the first, second, or fourth Thursday at two o'clock? Um, I'm not, are, are we able to discuss, if we're able to discuss that, then I can respond. Uh, we, uh, you can, yeah, it'd be okay to respond just to okay. clarify for sure. staff to come back sure. with it agenda item yes ha happy to do um thursday whatever whatever day um honestly i just it was just this particular uh time frame during the thursday because it starts for nctd it's from 2 p.m as well so that was the only thing so it could it could be the same day or it could be first second or fourth thursday totally yeah i see what you're saying okay great thank you for that any other um Future agenda items? No, I think we have a pretty full agenda for February. <laughs> Big decisions coming. Okay, well, I appreciate everybody's time and I think we got a lot done. So I will adjourn. Our next meeting is February 18th, 2021 at 2 p.m. And Solana Beach will be hosting virtually. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.